I'm Corey Anderson, and right now we're in Andover, South Dakota. This is a small town where I grew up, and I grew up with a unique uh, heritage. I grew. I was five days old when I attended my first steam engine show, and so I grew up with a with a background in in steam. Um, my parents had a passion to keep these old machines alive, and so growing up with that passion and being to all these steam shows as a kid, you know, getting to meet a lot of a lot of very incredible people and listening to the old timers who would tell stories, especially in the evening, you know, after a, a day of plowing or thrashing, running steam engines. As a young boy, that just really inspired me to listen to those stories and just hear about the incredible feats that hard work and just the, the will to keep going and the will to survive and, and work hard to, to make a living and provide for their families. We uh, have been steam uh, enthusiasts our whole lives and it all started when I was a, a young boy. My neighbor actually had a steam tractor and he would uh, steam that tractor up and drive it home from his dealership on Main Street of Andover to his home on the west side of Andover. He'd drive it home for lunch. And when I would hear the steam tractor steamed up, I would sneak out of school and I would go sit on that steam tractor all day and then my mother would have to go find me and uh, she wasn't very happy that I, I skipped school that day. But uh, it, uh, it, it grew to be a, a, a huge uh, hobby of interest for all of our family actually and, and uh, it was always the you know, building a fire and, and getting the water warmed up, getting the steam up and then slowly starting the tractor to run and uh, you know through the years we've collected steam tractors we rebuilt steam tractors we we uh, the, the, we built uh, one all from parts from about 1982 until 85 and 86 and that was the 110 horse case and that's the one that we built from parts we gathered up from all over the United States and Canada plus we actually casted parts for it too and then uh, that we found ourselves getting very interested in in the, the casting process and and if we could get involved with it and as luck would have it the hobby turned into a business uh, and we pour iron for lots of different customers and it sure is handy to have the foundry when we need a part for one of our tractors because the tractors are so old the the OEM the original equipment manufacturer does not have any parts on hand at all so the only way you get a part is you have to make it and so uh, it's, it's been very, very exciting. We, we got the 150 done and, and uh, you know, there was, uh, there's always a certain amount of people that, you know, th say that it was almost impossible and how could it possibly do what uh, we say it'll do. And, uh, and it's, it's just been a fantastic performer. learning about the steam engines that were built over the, the course of the many years. One really intrigued me as my dad and, and a lot of my mentors had all built the, the 110 horse case, which at the time was the largest steam engine that was really operating. It was one of the most successful plowing steam tractors that was ever produced. And the case company has, had built over 700 of them from 1907 to 1913. And so it was a very successful, large plowing uh, steam engine that actually broke a lot of the virgin sod and the ground that we farm today throughout the Midwest, the Dakotas, up through into Canada. And so there's just, there was just a few handful of these 110 horse cases surviving. Um, my dad had built one from parts and, and a number of our other friends had, had put them together or preserved them over the years. And so as, as a boy, I grew up on the 110. A uh, very good friend and mentor of mine, Jim Bryden, ran that engine for my dad. And so I grew up kind of running that 110 case with Jim. And I remember when I was about eight years old, uh, we were blading the road together and my dad and Danny Rowan were on the road grader and and Jim was driving the 110 case and he had to jump off for some reason. And he told me, push the lever ahead and it goes right and pull the lever back, it goes left. And he said, you're gonna, you're gonna drive from here on out. And he jumped off and, you know, of course being eight years old and, and it, was a, it was a little bit of a fear shock to, to have that, that power and responsibility in my hands. But Jim, 
was as and always has been an extraordinary mentor to me throughout my whole life and he just has the knowledge and, and insight to know when somebody's ready to go to the next level and fortunately you know I had a lot of people like that throughout my life that that invested in, in taking time to teach me and and mentor me throughout um, different skilled trades through the steam engine hobby teach me how to run steam engines and operate them and then to rebuild them and to learn machining, welding, and fabrication, all of the different things that I that I needed to learn. All right, Corey. Well, my dad took me to Rolog when I was eight years old, first time, and we had an 80 horse case and a 75 at home. So he got me started. And then uh, he was farming and I come home one day and I told him, I said, I'm going to get married. Well, he says, and you better go find a job. So then I went to work for Elmer Larson in Fargo. And that's where I, we fixed tractors and did record machine work. And then I got to know Kevin. Norman Pross introduced me to Kevin. And then uh, we started doing some work for him and we got visiting. And then Corey showed up and he was just like my second, like, like my son. And, and uh, he's just a wonderful person and, and sharp and probably the most knowledgeable person I know on when it comes to all this <coughs> machinery and figures and all this stuff out. He's helped me build my 6090 model, Twin City model. And I, would, I wouldn't get it done if I didn't have him to help me because he just, he can get it all figured out for me. So when I was in high school, I had asked my dad, when I was 16, I asked my dad if I could restore a 65 horse case. And that engine is just directly behind me here. The 65 horse case was uh, built in 1915. I was a little boy when my dad bought it at an auction sale in Rolog, Minnesota. And so he bought that engine in 1985. And, and then when I was 16, I told my dad, you know, I'd like to restore that engine because I'd, I'd been around steam engines quite a bit now and by that time and wanted to really understand how they operate. And so I, I f figured the best way to do that would be to tear one down completely, rebuild it 100% and put it back together. And so that's, that's what I did over the course of two years while I was going to high school and, and had a lot of insight and, and help from a lot of mentors who taught me how to do different processes throughout that journey. And, uh, and so that really, that learning that knowledge really inspired me to, to have the confidence to be able to, to go to the next level. And that, that level being um, building the 150 horse road locomotive uh, that was built by the Case Company in 1905. And so a fellow, a friend by the name of George Hedke, he had the only remaining piece of the one of these 150 case road locomotives. He had the original boiler from the first one that was built and that he brought it to a steam show in Rolog, Minnesota when I was just 10 years old. And so as a little boy seeing this last piece of, of, a, of a remaining significant part of history uh, really inspired me and, and, and the curiosity just drove me to want to understand like how big this thing was because all of the steam engines to a 10 year old boy seem really big and, and overwhelming and I couldn't imagine something being bigger than the 110 case which is big in, in and of itself and so the curiosity and, and, and just the, the desire to bring that engine back to life was always a dream of mine ever since I, ever since I was introduced to it when I was 10 years old. And when I was, so when I was 22, I, I came back, started my own business, Anderson Industries, and I started working with iron foundries because I knew that in order, order to preserve and to build a 35 ton tractor from scratch, I was gonna have to make a lot of castings. So I wanted to understand that process. And I started working with Dakota Foundry over in Webster, South Dakota, and having them cast some parts for me and I was making patterns. And so I started working on reproducing parts throughout the steam engine and gas tractor hobby. And then after, after a while, I felt comfortable enough, I went to Racine to the headquarters of Case and actually was looking for information. And some, a fellow by the name of Rich Torek was in charge of their archives at the time. And he had fortunately, uh, with some other, other people, had preserved a lot of the historical data that the, the Case company had. And so they said, you know, if we can, if you can find what you're looking for and you want to preserve this, this piece of case 
legacy will definitely help you to, to try to find that information and, and get you a copy of whatever you need to, to be able to do that. And so we went down in the archives, uh, we found all the majority of the original blueprints and so we copied those blueprints and so I had the original uh, engineering design files for a majority of that engine which was important because I wanted to be able to replicate that as, as much as possible to the original design that they built in 1905. And so having those blueprints, you know, I started to design and engineer every part into a 3D CAD system. And so I designed everything into 3D CAD. And from there we made foundry patterns and we were machining patterns. And some of the parts later on, we were able to 3D print sand molds. Once that technology uh, advanced, we were able to actually 3D print the sand molds that we poured the castings into and reproduced the, the castings that way without any tooling. And so in 2014, the, the foundry came up for sale. It was owned by a group of the employees who had bought it to keep their jobs and to keep the company alive about 10 years prior. And in 2014, they were ready to, to uh, transition that to the next generation. And so um, they had asked me if I'd be interested in, in acquiring the foundry. And, and I thought, well, this is, this is something I definitely have to do in order to build this engine because I need I need to make a lot of castings and and there's really no other option um, you know very good option for making that many castings and that complex and heavy of castings which was a very good fit for the foundry so I bought the foundry in 2014 and that's really when we started getting going making the the parts for the 150 had started making some patterns and we got a boiler built by Jonas Stutzman, JS company out in Ohio. He, he had built a, a new boiler for us. And so with a new boiler, having a foundry and having manufacturing facilities, we were all set to be able to start reproducing this 35 ton tractor from, from scratch. And so in 2016, I was on a trip to see a friend of mine, Gary Bradley, who lives in Sheridan, Wyoming. And, you know, I had mentioned to him, I brought a few parts out for the 150 that we had cast because I wanted to show them to him. And, and uh, he said, well, if you want to machine them while you're here, we can certainly do that. And so, so we machined up the parts while I was there. And he said, well, if you get some more parts cast and you want to come back and machine them, feel free to come back and we'll machine, I'll help you machine them. And so a couple weeks later, I cast a few more parts and, and came back out to Gary's and we machined them up. And, and uh, after a couple rounds of that, Gary goes, well, you might as well just build the whole engine out here. And so that's, that's what we actually ended up doing. And over the course of about 18 months, um, I was making a trip every week back and forth to Sheridan, Wyoming, about a nine hour drive from Sheridan to Webster. Every week I'd cast parts in Webster, make a trip out to Sheridan. Gary and I'd get them machined out there and then take us about a week to machine everything that we had cast. And then I'd come back We'd cast up another load of parts. And so just every week going back and forth for about 18 months until we had every, every piece we had cast and, and machined. Um, and we built every piece of it out at Gary's place in, in Sheridan, Wyoming. Yeah, um, my name's Gary Bradley. I live here in Sheridan, Wyoming. This is my shop we're in. Corey's here with me. And uh, steam engines, I guess I've been around them all my life. Uh, started out when I was about 10 years or old or so, I guess, uh, we, we thrashed with them at home there and we sawed lumber with them and I just bed around them and born and raised with them. My dad still liked the hobby very well. His name is Don Bradley and I'm sure most of you steam engine people have heard of him. And uh, I kind of just picked everything up from him and, and I bought all the ends from him that I have here. Well, except for some of them I bought on my own, but but I didn't get, a, get them to give to me. I had to buy them all. And I built this mach machine shop when I was in business. And Corey and I put the 150 case together here. Did a bust, well, all the machine work, I guess, on it. Uh, had a good time doing it. And uh, Corey's a good friend of mine, has been for a long time. But uh, no, we had a good time with it. it very interesting, very challenging. Getting the, getting the steering worm lined up with the boiler in the steering sector with the bracket and the castings up above so the shaft come in line with that, that was kind of kind of challenging. And as uh, far as boring the cylinder and everything, Corey built a jig 
at his shop and brought it out and we put the engine all together on that before we put it on the boiler. And so we had everything on the floor to work on it and that made that very nice. I mean, that took a lot of the headaches out of it. And I was kind of funny because Corey and I, we had the centric strap on that 150 is quite large. And I, the lay that I had was, well, I got, it was a 21 inch swing. That lathe wasn't big enough. So my friend Jim Bryden, he bought my old lathe and I bought a brand new summit that'll swing three foot, one half inch. And that's how we done the eccentric strap is on that. And that's what, why I had to buy a new lathe because we was working on the 150. Yep. <laughs> but uh, no, I enjoyed all of it. Uh, the only thing is there towards the end, I told Corey after we had the wheels and everything on it, I'm not getting up on top there too high. I get nosebleeds of heights. There was a couple large parts like the, the rear wheels. Uh, the rear wheels are eight feet in diameter. And then with extension rims, they're about four and a half feet wide. And so each wheel weighs about 7,500 uh, pounds in itself. And each, each wheel is constructed by a, a lot of steel fabricated parts and a, and a rolled rim. And then there's, there's cast ductile iron lugs and, and gears and stuff that are all riveted on. So in each wheel, we had 1,200 three quarter inch rivets to put in. And um, we did that up at Jim Bryden's shop at Larson Welding. Uh, so we set up and we built the wheels, the draw bar. We did all the heavy riveting up at Jim's shop in, in Fargo, North Dakota. We riveted them wheels together and machine the flywheel and oh, throttle valve and a few other things and come down here and help them a little bit. And, and everything that Corey makes and puts together, it all fits. It's so nice to work with something that, when we put the wheels together, there was, oh, around a thousand rivets in every wheel and every, every rivet fit in every hole. We didn't have to make anything fit. So I was glad to see when he got it done. When Kevin or Corey decide to do something, it will happen. We actually built the complete engine in, 18, in just 18 months. We started in April of 2017 at, at Gary's and, and then we finished it uh, the end of August 2018 and then we hauled uh, a friend of mine Mark Davidson is an incredible guy he's the truck he drives truck for RDO equipment and Mark wanted to to haul that engine back from Sheridan to Andover RDO equipment volunteered to to do that do that project and take it wherever we wanted to go and volunteered their equipment and, and their time and, and mileage and, and so just very blessed to have so many incredible people who, who wanted to help preserve this, this piece of history and this legacy and we got it back to Andover just before our, our show in, in 2018. We had, about, we had about 10 days before our show we got it back here and our goal was to pull 24 bottom, uh, 24 bottom John Deere plow and so we had never, you know, we had just got the engine put together. We'd never tested it on anything. All we had done is, is just really drive itself around. So I had no idea, you know, what, what this thing was capable of doing. And, and nobody, nobody did because none had survived. And so Friday we hooked onto the 24 bottom plow and, and just hoped and prayed that, that everything was going to go well. And, and fortunately, you know, it just, it just took off and walked away with the 24 bottom plow and could hardly tell that there was anything behind that engine. I guess I was just happy as could be. It probably wasn't one, one of the more happy moments I had in a long time. Because, you know, he talked about doing that for so long. And, and, uh, and like I said, I knew it would, would come, it would come too. And yeah, it was an honor, honor and a half to get to drive it around. Yeah, I don't know, there, I don't, can't think of another engine that he could probably could put together to make a guy feel any better than that one. They didn't make that many to start with, and then it's a, a duplicate, I mean, and an exact duplicate. It ain't one just cobbled together. It's made just like it's supposed to be, every piece. So it's just a, it's a fun hobby, lots of great people. And we used to go up to Austin, Manitoba to show up there and run the 110Ks up there. And the guy says, you come all the way up here to run that? <clears throat> no, I says, I got one at home I can run. I come up here to visit. I said, the people we meet, is three fourths of you know the other fourth is having the machinery. No, this is the nicest hobby I think you can be in. Nobody's trying to outdo anybody. You know, just everybody goes at their own pace. And whether you're fixing up a D John Deere or 110 case, they're both important. 
So, and then you get to come out here and work and play and visit with everybody. It just, just don't get no better. Yeah. We want to keep his, history, you know, history alive. And that's why it's important to get all the younger people can in, you know, working with it. And I got my grandkids going when they were about seven, eight years old. And it's, you know, people that way, people can see how things were done in the old days. It wasn't today, you know, they just get in the tractor, turn on the key and away they go. They didn't have to spend two hours getting steamed up and, and have 10 people do what one person can do today. So after you run one of these all day long in the sun, you really appreciate that cab with air conditioning. And hopefully the young people will keep coming and we'll keep this stuff alive for another hundred years or whatever. It was just an incredible inspiration for me, the, the amount of people that came out and volunteered and helped throughout the project. Um, you know, guys like Gary Bradley who, who donated their shop and equipment and two years of their life to, to help bring this, this engine, you know, this, this legacy of, of a tractor back to life. Um, it's just so inspiring and uh, it's, it's incredible what you can achieve when you get a group of people together all, all rallied around a common vision and a really important mission to do something like, like we did in preserving this engine. And so I'm just, I'm just very thankful for the, the friends and the people that, that came and made this all possible.